So, so I'll yeah I'll just uh, yeah. So thank you, Professor Sharma, again for uh, you know accepting our invitation to speak uh, uh, in this subsurface mechanics webinar series. I would uh, request I, yeah, uh, Professor Jitendra Sangwai uh, Professor to introduce Sharma Professor for, Sharma. Uh, accepting our invitation to speak. Maybe uh, Ramesh, you can just uh, mute yourself. Sure. Uh, yes, I started the video. You can. So thank you, Professor Sharma, for uh, accepting the invitation. So let me introduce uh, today's uh, distinguished speaker as a part of our webinar series. Uh, so, Professor Mukul M. Sharma is the professor and holds the Tex Montcrieff Chair in the Department of Petroleum Geosystem and Chemical Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin, where he has, begin, uh, he has been there for past 36 years. He served as the chairman of the department from 2001 to 2005, and his current research interests include hydraulic fracturing, oil field water management, formation damage, and improved oil recovery. He has published uh, more than 450 journal articles and conference proceedings and has 21 patents to his credit. He founded Austin Geotech Services as an exploration and production consulting company in 1996. He also co-founded Leyline Petroleum in 2006, which had a very close success, a very successful exit in 2013. Uh, Nividat Energy in 2017 and Geothermics LLC in 2020. Professor Sharma has a B.Tech in Chemical Engineering from IIT Kanpur, from where I did my PhD. Uh, and also he has a MS and PhD in Chemical Engineering, uh, uh, Chemical and Petroleum Engineering from the University of Southern California. Professor Sharma is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering and an honorary member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. He is the recipient of the 2017 John Franklin Carl uh, Award and 2009 Lucas Gold Medal. Uh, SP's highest technical awards, which are highly competitive. Uh, he has also received a 2004 uh, uh, SP Faculty Distinguished Achievement Award, a 2002 uh, Lester C. Urine Award, uh, the 1998 SP Formation Evaluation Award, and the Distinguished Alumnus Award from IIT Kanpur and University of Southern California. He served as an SP Distinguished Lecturer in 2002 and has served on the editor board of many journals and taught and consulted for industry worldwide. So I welcome Professor Sharma and uh, 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 we are really very really happy to be here as a part of uh, you know, uh, you know, this webinar series and we'll really have a, a, a you know, pleasure to listen to you. So please, uh, uh, I request Professor Sharma to uh, you know, uh, have uh, you know, his uh, talk uh, in the uh, August uh, audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jitendra. Um, and thank you for inviting me to, uh, to speak in this, in this forum. So um, uh, I know that everybody is uh, pressed on time. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and jump into the presentation directly. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So I just want to acknowledge all the people over the years. Uh, the, what I'm going to talk about today, there are many things that I could talk about, but what I wanted to talk about is something related to geomechanics and hydraulic fracturing, which is uh, of interest to, to uh, many of you. Some of you are not involved in this area, um, but uh, I just, so I'll, I'll lay the stage for why we are interested in this, why we care about this and so forth. Uh, the big picture item, the, the big picture here is that we are really talking about energy related matters, right? And um, this is an important and an extremely important um, um, uh, way of developing uh, any country. And uh, I just took one slide from 2019, which shows the human development index, which basically is, you know, what, what is the level of um, uh, the standard of living in a particular country? whether people have lights and fans or TVs and fridges and uh, et cetera, et cetera, air conditioning and so forth. Um, and you can see that it's directly correlated with uh, the annual electric power consumption or energy consumption, if you like, right? So uh, energy lays the foundation for just about everything that we do as a society, whether it's agriculture or whether it's industry, it plays an extremely important role. So having, a good, inexpensive, reliable source of energy uh, 
is absolutely crucial. Um, if you look at the US, and I'll talk about the US um, and, and then mention uh, some of the statistics in India, but you, you notice that um, the primary energy consumption in the US has been uh, essentially, if you look at renewables are the green up here, um, a nuclear, petroleum, natural gas. So coal is on the way down, as you might expect, and natural gas is, is actually grown quite a bit. Uh, petroleum has remained relatively constant and nuclear has remained relatively constant. Uh, renew renewables has grown, but it's still a pretty small a fraction of the overall, um, out of 100%, maybe about 10% is, is renewables. And I think going into the future, uh, this mix is going to change uh, relatively little. Coal is going to continue to decline. Natural gas is going to continue to grow. Uh, petroleum is going to remain relatively constant over the next 10, 15 years. Uh, in the long haul, which means about 40, 50 years, uh, you will see more and more uh, perhaps nuclear, and perhaps some uh, clever form of renewables um, that, that is going to develop further. But you can see that the picture hasn't changed tremendously, despite all the, the stuff you hear about in the media. Um, so why do we, how does energy relate to fracturing and geomechanics, and why should we care about geomechanics, and why should we care about fracturing? So Today, fractured oil and gas wells provide the vast majority of the world's energy. And you saw that on the previous slide, right? So this is responsible for the development of unconventional reservoirs um, by increasing the flow area coming into the well. Uh, and in the past, they have been, this has been used to remove near well bore damage, improve productivity of low permeability rocks, and also for sand control, which is very important in offshore fields. Many of the offshore fields produce sand, and one way to prevent this is to do hydraulic fracturing or frack packing. Right? Uh, some people have the misconception that hydraulic fracturing is used only in shales or in unconventionals. This is not true. Uh, uh, hydraulic fracturing is used in many, many wells uh, that are conventional. In fact, very highly permeable sands, we also do hydraulic fracturing. So it's just about every well drilled in the US today is hydraulically fractured. Um, it is also essential for the development of alternative energies like geothermal energy. And I've been involved in this in the last few years. So the only way to really get uh, commercial amounts of geothermal energy is to hydraulically fracture the well. Um, we have recently been getting into uh, uh, the production of things like uh, rare earth elements like lithium, cobalt, things like that. So where do you think lithium comes from? Well, it comes from the earth. And what's the most efficient way of recovering lithium is by producing brine. And how do you produce brine? By producing a very large amount of water from the earth. And how do you produce very large amounts of water from the earth? By hydraulic fracturing. So, so with, no matter how you slice it, you are going to deal with producing large volumes of fluid from the earth. And this production of large volumes of either energy or, or brine or oil or gas requires um, uh, engineering the earth, which means doing geomechanics and hydraulic fracturing. So, so regardless of where you stand on what you think the future of energy is going to be, uh, this, this, and this engineering science of fracturing and geomechanics is going to be around. I want to show you the impact of all of this um, on US um, oil and gas production, particularly, um, because that we have a lot of historical data for that. Um, so if you look at U.S. oil production uh, over the years, um, what you find is that the production was supposed to go down steadily um, to about 4 million barrels. It reached for about 5 million barrels a day. Um, and then around here is when hydraulic fracturing really began to be implemented on a large scale. And you can see the increase in production. There have been some bumps along the road for various reasons, uh, hurricanes and things like that. Uh, but really end up COVID, of course, having an impact here. Um, but you can see that growing from 5 million barrels to about 12 million barrels, um, more than doubling the oil production in a mature province like the U.S. Uh, was entirely related to horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. Um, if you compare this with the increase in production related to, let's say, 
any other method, enhanced oil recovery or something else, it's about a hundred times more than EOR, for example, right? So, so it has a huge impact on, on the production of oil and gas. Same thing with natural gas. If you look at natural gas production in the US, it has grown from about 70 million to about 115 million. This COVID effect is, is temporary. It'll go back up again. So um, you can see that um, it has had a very large impact on, on natural gas production as well. Um, most of this production uh, has come from US uh, unconventionals. So if you look at all of these different plays, unconventional plays, uh, these are all shale gas plays or shale oil plays. And you can see that the, uh, for, the, for a gas production, um, Marcellus is the biggest one. For oil production, it's the uh, West Texas or um, uh, the Permian Basin that is the biggest uh, contributor. But this, all of this is uh, gas production from uh, unconventionals uh, and related to hydraulic fracturing and geomechanics. By the way, the, if you compare this production numbers with the production in India, uh, if my numbers are correct, and I, have, I haven't looked this up recently, but I think uh, India produces about 750,000 barrels. I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but I think it's about 750,000 barrels. So, so this is uh, about uh, 15 times larger than, than India's current production. And what I noticed even more, um, um, uh, which is even a li little bit more scary, was that uh, we import in India about 80% of the oil and gas, um, or I should say oil particularly. And we also have a declining production. So last year production dropped by about 3.2%. So getting that production up is, is important. So that lays the groundwork for why hydraulic fracturing and geomechanics is important. It plays a crucial role in, in no matter what kind of energy you, you, want to, uh, you want to think is going to be important, it's going to be uh, uh, relevant to, to that source of energy. So what we've been working on for the past 15, 20 years uh, is integrating uh, geomechanics uh, models and combining these models into um, something that is usable, uh, both in academics as well as in industry. Um, so integrating fracture propagation, geomechanics, and reservoir simulation. Um, and uh, what has historically happened in uh, the petroleum uh, business is that we have had a lot of reservoir simulation done. So uh, in reservoir simulation, you're solving multi-phase flow problems in the reservoir. Um, this could be compositional, uh, where you, you actually keep track of individual components like C1, C2, C3, C4, and so on, and then do a flash calculation to get saturations of oil, water, and gas. Um, or you can do a black oil simulator, and that's been done for a long time. Uh, however, um, when you combine geomechanics with this, then the problem gets much more complicated. And if you combine geomechanics, reservoir flow, and hydraulic fracturing, then the problem gets even more complicated. So what we have done, which I'll show you here and how we did this, is to explicitly model fracture propagation at different length scales. Um, so in the past, for example, people had modeled fractures simply as being high permeability grid blocks. So you have, you grid the reservoir and you assign high permeability to the grid block. That is uh, maybe okay for some flow problems, but it's definitely not okay if you're trying to simulate things like prop and transport in the fracture, or if you're trying to simulate the interaction between fractures, the mechanical interaction between fractures. So stress interference, multiple fractures, poroelastic effects, thermoelastic effects. You have to model these fractures explicitly rather than just assigning a grid block a high permeability. And things like heterogeneous rocks, um, complex fluids, uh, phase behavior, and so on. So we in incorporated all of this uh, into our models, as you will see here in a minute. Uh, and then the geomechanical and flow coupling between the wellbore, the fractures, and the reservoir, these are all coupled together. So um, the difficulty in doing this is we build these extremely complicated models, which you will see here in a minute. But to make this practically useful, it is essential to provide the user some flexibility. So the guy sitting in the frack truck in the field doesn't really want to run 
model that takes two days to run with a finite element or a finite volume code. Right? He wants to get an answer fairly quickly. The person sitting and doing research in the lab may want to run the code uh, over two days. Right? Um, so the, the flexibility in choosing the physics and the numerical complexity, depending on the problem that you're trying to solve, is extremely important. Right? Because otherwise the model uh, resides with just a few experts, maybe a handful of experts, and is not used very widely. So what we've done, uh, I made this list about 10, 15 years ago in terms of what, what did we want to include in these models. So we wanted to include fracture complexity, that is the interaction between fractures, the stress shadow effects, photoelastic effects and thermoelastic effects, non-planar fractures, so the fractures can turn, and multi-stranded fractures, which means that the fractures can have multiple branches. Uh, and then rock complexity, uh, basically having uh, natural fractures or induced unpropped fractures, heterogeneity in the rock, inelastic rock behavior, plasticity, for example. So that is something we wanted to include. And then fluid complex, uh, complexity. Uh, so prop and transport models, uh, non-isothermal flow, compressible fluids, et cetera, phase changes, turbulent flow. So these all had to be included as well. So it's, as you can see, it's a very complicated uh, physics that goes into these. And then of course, wellbore effects, which we initially thought was not very important, but turns out is extremely important um, in, in terms of how the propane distributes itself in the wellbore and between different perforations and clusters. So our approach to this um, is that we have over the last 15, 17 years, been working on in something called, um, uh, uh, we, we've developed a, a library of shared models. When you have a large number of graduate students or postdocs working on a problem, uh, everybody tries to develop their own code. And then when they leave, then the code just sits there and it's not usable by anybody else. So what, what, what I decided to do was to build a library of shared models. These, we call these the FROG Framework for Operations in General Geomechanics. These are all uh, models that are written in C++. Um, and they're all inherently uh, uh, 3D. Um, and uh, they use linear elastic fracture mechanics, a cohesive zone model for fracture propagation, uh, one of the two. Um, and then it also solves uh, you know, uh, reservoir models with multi-phase flow, black oil, and compositional reservoir geomechanics. And um, these tools um, were then um, implemented in something called OpenFOAM, which some of you might be familiar with. So OpenFOAM actually has a library of tools for meshing and for um, uh, also for solving, uh, for, for basically PDE solvers, essentially, right? And there's about, I would say, 300 universities around the world who actually use and develop uh, uh, OpenFOAM packages. And so, um, the nice thing is that you have all this capability being developed around the world, which you can use. So it's being built very quickly. Um, the bad thing is that there's very little documentation. Uh, so you have to really learn how to, how to use it and, and, and get uh, familiar with it. So, so we've built our own uh, 2D, pseudo 3D or, or fully 3D options. Uh, these are all parallelized uh, with dynamic mesh refinement and unrefinement. These are finite volume codes, not finite elements. So, uh, as there's a large group here at UT Austin, um, uh, Mary Wheeler and Demkovitz and so on that work on finite element methods. So this is a, uh, a, a, a closely related cousin to finite element, which is finite volume, uh, which turns out to be a, a, a fairly good way of solving the problem uh, in, in this case. Um, and you can run this on Windows or Unix platforms. And it is, we have solvers that are semi-implicit or fully implicit and so on. Um, we also use surrogate models, uh, which are data-driven, which I'll show you an example of. So this is the structure of, this, of, this, uh, of the model that we have built over, over many years and probably about 20 PhD students. Uh, and integrating all that work into one has been, has been uh, uh, I think, a, a major achievement here in terms of just being able to do everything together. So we have a reservoir domain um, in which we have, we solve the pressure equation, the component balance equations, and I'll show you these in a minute. Uh, the solid deformation equation, uh, 
And of course, these two are related through poroelasticity. Then we solve the temperature equation in the reservoir and there's thermoelasticity between these, right? And then there's phase behavior. So there's always coupling between, between all of these. The reservoir domain is coupled to the fracture domain where you have fracture pressure component balance equations. So just the same as here, except now you're solving it inside the fracture. And then you also have propent in here. So you have the slurry velocity, the propent concentration, et cetera. And then you have um, the temperature equation in the fracture. So you have fluxes of, of heat in, in the fracture. Uh, and of course, these are coupled with the reservoir. So the thermal flux between the fracture and the reservoir is coupled, uh, et cetera. So all of these, uh, there's leak off and production between the fracture and the, and the reservoir. And then there's the wellbore domain where you have component balance equations in the wellbore itself. Uh, phase behavior and then temperature in the well bore. So these are all closely coupled and, and solved and uh, solved together. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have actually solved the, um, uh, accounted for the fractures explicitly as cracks in the domain. So we can turn these fractures at some angle theta, and then we create these new faces in the mesh. Um, so we solve the fluid and proper transport equations in the fracture. And then, of course, calculate the pressure along the fracture, account for stress interference between fractures, and then we implement the proper fracture propagation criteria at the tip, and then allow for fracture turning and leak off and so on. But the fact is that the fracture is actually uh, a separate domain which is being solved. And this domain has a very small width, typically of the order of millimeters, whereas the reservoir is hundreds of meters. So you have to solve these equations in separate domains. Uh, so if you look at the equations themselves, uh, the solid deformation equation in, uh, uh, in the reservoir looks like this. It's basically solving uh, uh, Hooke's law with linear poroelasticity using finite volume discretization in space. And you can see that uh, the finite volume thing has, you have to have normal stresses and so on acting. So I'm not going to go into the details because I don't have the time, but there are papers on this that you can certainly um, look at. Um, the flow equations are classical reservoir equations for the black oil simulator in the reservoir. So those of you that are familiar with uh, black oil reservoir simulation, you'll, you'll recognize these equations. Those of you that are not, um, don't worry about it. We, we solve for the pressure, solve for the saturation of water, oil, and gas. Um, and um, those are the primary unknowns uh, in these equations. Um, and then if you have a compositional simulator, then we are tracking individual components like C1, C2, C3, C4, et cetera. And we have a mass conservation equation for each component and a pressure equation, which is the summation of all of these. Um, so, so we solve this compositional flow and then um, we also do the phase behavior in, in that. So the temperature equation is just an energy balance and this is all being done in 3D. So, um, so we solve the energy balance in the reservoir and in the well bore and in the fracture. And then we couple these, of course, because there is a coupling between the temperature and the stresses. So photoelasticity is here, thermoelasticity is here, and we could couple these together. Um, okay. Um, so you can actually write down similar equations for the fracture. So what I showed you earlier was for the reservoir, you can do similar equations for the fracture, uh, compositional flow in the fracture, proper transport in the fracture, which is an additional complication inside the fracture. Uh, there's proper settling, there's proper retardation. There's several papers written on this. So there was uh, two PhD dissertations um, on how we model retardation effects and proper settling effects um, and so on. So, so there's quite a bit of effort that's gone into this. this um, several papers on, on uh, how you model turbulent flow of propent inside a fracture, and how do you model settling as well as uh, uh, propent flow in that. Um, and then you fracture closure. So in other words, when you stop pumping, then the fracture might actually close and the width is going to be reduced. And so that's something that we have modeled. And then there's criteria for um, fracture propagation and fracture turning. How do you determine the angle at which the fracture turns and so forth? So the fracture mechanics is, is accounted for. And the governing equations in the wellbore are of course the mass conservation equation, the momentum conservation equations, 
um, in the wellbore itself, which is meshed separately. Uh, the difficulty in, in doing this uh, um, is that you have a fluid as well as a solid. So you have propent that is actually in the wellbore. And so, so you actually have to distribute this fluid into this, into the, uh, into the, um, uh, into the, uh, into the perforation. So the way horizontal fracturing works is you have a horizontal wellbore and you have a plug that's set. And in any given stage, you have clusters of perforations. So these are holes in the steel casing through which the fluid and the propent is pushed into the rock. So in this particular example, there are four clusters. And as the fluid is being pumped, it's leaking off from here, it's going into each of these clusters. There may be you know, anywhere from three to 10 perforations in each cluster. And the question then becomes of the fluid that's being pumped, how much of the fluid is going here? How much of the fluid is going here? How much of it is going here and, and there? And how much of the sand or propent is going into each of these? So that's a non-trivial question because, um, uh, and of course, before the stage is being pumped, there has been another stage that has been pumped, which has uh, fractures in it here as well. So the effect of these fractures is felt by these fractures that are created uh, in this stage. So we actually ran, um, there's been two PhD students, actually the third one just graduated uh, last month on looking at what happens if you have a wellbore and if you have particles and fluid flowing in this wellbore, and if you have a perforation and the fluid is escaping from this perforation, how much of the solids go with the fluid and how much of the solids remain in the wellbore, right? So we actually did CFD DEM simulations, computational fluid dynamics, discrete element model simulations of this problem with many hundreds of thousands of particles. These simulations were run on our supercomputer because it requires a large amount of uh, computation time. And we calculated what the uh, effects are of velocity, pipe diameter, particle size, particle density, and so on, and calculated what is the uh, fraction of particles escaping from each perforation. And we termed this propent transport efficiency curves or correlations. The propent transport efficiency is the efficiency by which the propent goes into this perforation. The, the, the propent goes into the perforation. Uh, you realize that because of inertia, because the particles are heavier than the fluid, they will tend to continue along with the fluid and not turn the corner. So uh, you will see propent transport efficiency curves that look like this. So this is prop, prop and transport efficiency versus the perforation flow ratio. So this defines how much fluid is entering a perforation. So in this case, 40% of the fluid is entering the perforation, but only 20% of the sand is entering that perforation because of inertia. And it turns out that this has a very big effect on how the fractures are created. Uh, we didn't realize this 10 years ago, but now we do. And so we have incorporated these. Uh, these um, correlations took us about two years to generate on the supercomputer because each run would take about four to five days. So ultimately we converted all this very complicated uh, simulation into a set of correlations. And those correlations you can put in Excel or in a reservoir simulator. And so we, we call these surrogate models. Uh, and these surrogate models are basically representations of the results from all these extremely complicated simulations because it's impractical to run these simulations with the other simulator. So the correlations are very simple, but they are based on some very complicated CFD, D, and simulations. So we use these correlations in our models, and that allows us to accurately depict how the propent and the fluid is distributed along each of the perforations. So how much does this perforation get? How much does this perforation get? And so on. And that turns out to be extremely important because if one perforation, one set of perforations gets too much fluid, supposing this one gets too much fluid, you can actually find that this will grow, or this fracture will grow and the other fractures won't. So you won't be uh, uniformly stimulating the well. And that uh, has a big impact on production. And I say big, I mean a factor of two, a factor of three change in the production. So, uh, so it's not a small effect, it's a quite a large effect. And we have shown that this is indeed what happens downhole um, uh, uh, when I say we, uh, the, the industry has shown, Shell and other companies have shown that this actually happens. 
um, by running a fiber optic cable behind the casing and measuring indirectly how much sand is going here, how much sand is going here, how much sand is going here. And what they typically find is that you get heel dominated uh, fractures with most of the sand ends up going here, unless you do something different. You change the number of perforations along here and so forth. So, so this is a, an interesting and important problem that we have been working on for the past 10 years. Um, so when we solve the, uh, the, 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 these equations, the PDEs, you basically solve for displacements, the U, right? And you solve for the pressures in the, in the reservoir and also in the fracture. And essentially um, the P equation coefficients, uh, the PF, which is the pressure in the fracture, the propent, uh, different, uh, you can have different kinds of propent, different sizes of propent. So propent one, propent two, and then the fluid distribution equations and the proper distribution equations in the well bore. So these are all solved either implicitly or semi-implicitly. And you can do this in parallel. So we have actually executed this in parallel with uh, many, many different cores. And of course you get quite a bit of, uh, if you num depending on the number of CPUs, you get quite a bit of speed up. So you can get a speed up of uh, seven, eight, 10 times. Um, and that really helps because these simulations can be Quite time consuming. Um, you can also do mesh refinement and unrefinement. So we've done uh, six, seven levels of mesh refinement. Uh, and here's an example of that. Uh, you can see fractures growing from a well bore, and you can see the mesh is refined around the fracture uh, and unrefined up beyond that. And you can see that these fractures are turning because they're interacting with each other. So if I play this one more time, you'll see that these are growing simultaneously, the next stage growing simultaneously, the next stage growing simultaneously. So, so you can simulate this and um, you can actually get... Um... So all of this is great and it's quite complicated, but you know, the, the fracture modeler understands the physics of the problem, but rarely designs any frac jobs and has poor access to data and uh, may not understand the field limitations. The field engineer needs a quick answer and may not understand the physics of the problem, but basically is rewarded for doing whatever people before him have been doing and may have some unrealistic expectations of the model. So, so what we did was we actually built this multi frac 3D model, which actually has um, uh, a very nice uh, interface as well, because otherwise nobody wants to use these models. Um, you can change the units, SI or field units, 2D or 3D. You can do reservoir simulation, fracture simulation, fracturing and reservoir simulation. Um, and you can have geomechanical settings, only flow, no coupling, one-way coupling between flow and geomechanics, two-way coupling, uh, photoelastoplasticity. Uh, you, we have also done uh, displacement discontinuity methods for naturally fractured reservoirs and pseudo 3D models, which are very fast models. You can do single phase black oil or compositional. You can do isothermal or, or non-isothermal flows. You can choose different options for the numerical scheme and so forth. So this provides you with a model that is fit for purpose. If somebody wants to get a quick answer, you choose a pseudo 3D model with single phase and isothermal case, it'll run in a few seconds, right? And so um, I, what I've realized is that it is important uh, to, uh, to provide these alternatives to people. Otherwise, the research that we do um, sits on a, on a shelf and nobody ever uses it. Right? And so doing this is, is essential to make it usable and, uh, and make it useful to the engineering community. Um, so there are lots of examples of these kinds of simulations. You can really solve just about any kind of flow and geomechanics problem that you can think of. Um, so design of completions in perforation clusters, um, looking at well productivity using different energized fluids. So for example, CO2 or nitrogen as a fracturing fluid. Um, using multi-fracture propagation. In other words, if you have multiple fractures propagating, uh, how, do we use, how do we model that? using stranded gas as a fracturing fluid. And we've done projects on every one of these. Uh, what is the impact of prop and size? Uh, fluid rheology and fracture closure. Uh, how do we model fracture containment, including thermal effects and photoelastic effects? So 
So there has been projects written on projects done on every single one of these. And so um, I am, how much, what, what, what are we, how are we doing time-wise? I, how much, how long have I gone? We still have about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, okay. And good. then Q&A following up on that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I can, I can continue and, and show you a few more results. So um, here's, here's an example of uh, what happens uh, in terms of fluid and propane distribution um, in a typical well if you don't do anything. So in other words, here is a case where um, we have the heel, which is, uh, so if you have a well bore, then uh, you have the heel side and then you have the toe side of the, of the horizontal well. And you can see here that almost 90% or 95% of the propent and fluid goes to the heel side. And the toe side doesn't see very much. And the reason for this is that the toe side clusters see very high propent concentrations and that screens them out. And as a result, you get this behavior. And this has been observed using um, fiber optic data. This is, uh, this is acoustic data from the fiber optic cable. Uh, and the same kind of thing that you see here in the simulations is also seen in the field. Um, if you were to improve this by simply changing the distribution uh, of the fluid by changing the number of perforations in each cluster. So here's four perforations in, a, in each cluster and there's eight clusters. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight clusters with four perforations in each cluster. Here, I've changed the number of, of perforations in a cluster. Three, two, four, six, four, five. And you can see that you get much more uniform distribution when you do that. So here, uh, SD is the standard deviation of uh, the fluid and the propent, and you get much more uniform distribution. And as a result, you get almost double the production. So the propent surface area is much higher and the, the hydraulic surface area is, is much better. So you can optimize this problem. And this is done using um, uh, some artificial intelligence tools to actually do this optimization of this, of this problem. So you can actually see um, significant improvements in production um, when you do this kind of design of perforation clusters. Uh, some other examples of this, um, you can actually do uh, what, what is called um, zipper fracturing, where you fracture one well, then you fracture the other well, and you fracture this well, and you fracture the other well. And um, this can actually uh, lead to some very interesting in improvements in, in production. You can also do choke management, uh, and this can be done in the model as well. So sequencing and staggering and lagging of stages, I'll show you an example of this. Uh, so here, for example, is uh, you fracture this, you fracture, um, basically all the fractures are being done uh, in a single well. These are two wells, two horizontal wells, a thousand feet apart. And you can see that you know, these fractures will grow and so on. Um, if you do this in a different way, and instead of using a single well, where you fracture this well, and then you fracture this well next, you get, a, you get very different results, you get very different, because the fractures are interacting with each other. These fractures are interacting with these fractures. These fractures are now interacting with this and that. And so you get very different results. And you can quantify this, you can quantify this uh, by looking at things like, this is sequential fracturing in, a, in, in each well. This is zipper fracturing. And zipper fracturing means you do well one, then you do well two, then you go back to well one, you go back to well two. This is what is routinely done today. Uh, and it was not being done about six, seven years ago. So this is, uh, and so what you find is that the average fracture length is, is, is 411, is 364, but the standard deviation is 216. And here it's 158. And what you want is you want a small standard deviation so that you don't have dominant fractures that are uh, bypassing uh, reserves. So having a small standard deviation, having a much more uniform uh, fracture is, is, uh, is, is important. Right? So zipper fracturing does improve uh, this uh, the performance of these uh, of these wells and that's been shown in the field many many times now so i'm not going to go through that um, you can also do staggering in other words one well sits above the other well so this is in 3d 
where instead of having the wells on the, at the same depth, you actually have one well that's above and one other well is below. And that can have a big effect as well. So um, you can see, for example, that the interference between these fractures. So as, as you fracture these wells, you can see the impact of staggering and uh, displacing these things. So you notice that uh, the fractures are not right next to each other. They are staggered by about 30 feet and that makes a big difference. And then vertically they're staggered as well. Um, you can also do life cycle simulation of wells, um, fracture and then do reservoir simulation, depletion, effect of depletion and fracture design, parent child well issues. Basically, if you fracture these wells now, and then you come back five years later and you put a well in the middle and you want to fracture that, what, is, what will happen? Gas reinjection, refracturing of depleted wells, a gas injection for improved oil recovery, et cetera. So there's many, many applications of this um, that you can see. Um, and so if you have a depletion, so you've, you've created the fractures, the pressure is now being depleted, and now you're creating fractures in the middle well, and this middle well is now going to go towards the depleted uh, zone. So you can study this problem of, um, of parent-child well interaction, which turns out to be a very important problem in the US now, because a lot of people are drilling wells between old wells. And um, one way to avoid this problem uh, is to preload uh, the parent well. In other words, you pressurize the parent well to prevent frack hits. Frack hits are uh, the child well fractures intersect the parent well that causes problems with, um, uh, with these. So, so frack hits are basically the child well fractures are hitting the parent well fractures. And, and that is uh, not what you want because you're going into a depleted reservoir when you do that. Um, so how do, how do we pressurize the parent well? How long do you have to wait to soak it and so on? Um, Another interesting problem is a fracture propagation in unconventional or conventional wells. This is actually an example taken from uh, uh, the Bering Sea uh, near Norway, where there's, water, there's a water injection well, and there's a fracture growing in the injection well. And the question is, will this fracture be contained by the shale? Uh, because of the thermal conduction and so on, will this, will this uh, so cold water will result in less compressive stress around here, right? And there's, there's a producer producing well over here. Um, and then injection, the poroelastic effects cause a compressive zone. These are the, these are the poroelastic effects. These are thermoelastic effects. And then the stress contrast between the bounding shale and the sand controls the vertical height growth of this fracture. And this stress contrast is affected by heat conduction. And so there's heat conduction happening here, which results in a reduction. And I'll show you an example. Oh, I don't have that slide. But if we have, you can actually look at a vertical cross section of this for the stresses and show under what conditions this fracture will be contained and under what conditions will it grow into the shale because the stresses in the shale are being reduced because of the thermal conduction into the shale. So these kind of problems are crucial. In this particular case, the development of the entire field was dependent on the containment of these fractures, because if the, if the fracture cannot be contained, you wouldn't get permits to develop the field because the fracture would go up to the seafloor and that's not acceptable. So, so you would have to make sure that you inject at rates and pressures where the fracture remains contained. So this is all completely dominated by uh, thermoelastic, photoelastic effects, uh, Again, geomechanics and fracturing playing uh, the dominant role. Uh, this is improved oil recovery um, uh, by huff and puff. So when you soak the fluid, so this requires compositional simulation of the reservoir. And so uh, without going into it in detail, uh, there's been a lot of uh, field trials of um, including geomechanics, not including geomechanics, doing compositional uh, simulation, et cetera. So let me just summarize. Um, uh, by coupling a multi-phase reservoir flow, geomechanics, well bore flow, with fracture growth and closure, we get a very versatile tool that can be used for reservoir simulation um, in 3D, photoelastic effects, and so on. Uh, 
geomechanics options, uh, thermal options, fracturing options, reservoir options um, for different heterogeneity, natural fractures, and so on. I didn't show you an example of natural fractures, but uh, we have several examples of that. Uh, fluid and propent options with different fairly complex fluids, and then uh, numerical options, um, catalyzation, uh, mesh refinement, et cetera. Right? Um, so a user can then choose what these options are and um, apply them to various problems, whether it's produced water reinjection, water flooding, waste disposal by injection, well bore stability, casing failure, geothermal wells, sand production. And we have done many of these applications over the years as the tool has grown and different students have added more and more capability to the tool, we have been able to, uh, to do this. And so this is available. Those of you that are interested can actually go to, uh, to this website and Multifrac 3D is the, is the tool that I'm, I've been talking about. Um, there are other tools, but don't worry about those right now. But Multifrac 3D is the tool that, uh, that you can go to. And, um, and these are all uh, for the, this is actually for uh, JIP members and so on. So I'm not going to. So um, I think it's important for modelers to offer users as complete a set of simulation tools as possible. Mm -hmm. And of course, this involves development of new numerical methods, development of new mathematical techniques, incorporation of new physics, incorporation of new diagnostic tools, all of that. But ultimately, the user is going to use this set of simulation tools only if they are accessible to them and understandable by them. Um, and it is equally important for the user to be educated enough to choose the right level of complexity that captures all the first order effects because there's no way that you can simulate everything. Um, and I think you need to pick the right physics that is critical to your problem that you are trying to solve. Um, and if you can do that, then you can run simulations in a reasonable time frame using these simulation tools. Otherwise, you get stuck with simulations that run for days and really aren't giving you the answer that is any better than a, a much simpler simulation would provide you. Right. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll thank you very much. These are all the many companies that have supported us over the years. And um, I will stop here and take any questions. Thank you, Professor Sharma. Uh, that was really a very uh, interesting talk. Um, so we're open for questions. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, please feel free to chat in the Q&A panel and um, Professor Sharma will address them. Um, I'll begin, uh, you know, uh, so as uh, a researcher at ExxonMobil, I think uh, I really, you know, uh, when I was there, I really connect uh, with what you mm -hmm. said today about a feed for purpose tool for geomechanics. So there was always this, uh, you know, uh, competition between the time it takes for a simulation and the fidelity that you need, uh, uh, you know, for these simulations. So um, uh, the, uh, one of the questions I have is that, uh, you know, um, what do you think are some of the outstanding challenges that remain uh, uh, in terms of, uh, particularly in terms of, uh, let's say, tools that we need for modeling fracture propagation for these kinds of problems? Yeah. Oh, there are many, many outstanding problems still remaining. I mean, there's uh, lots of problems. I think one of the biggest problems we have is um, the complexity that you get in the subsurface uh, with natural fractures and heterogeneity and so on, is something that we don't, uh, that we cannot model very easily. So for example, if you have lots of bedding planes, some of these bedding planes will slip and some of them will remain rigid. So the propagation of fractures through these is not very well understood as to how it happens. Um, there's issues re regarding um, uh, slippage and plasticity in many of these cases. There's issues uh, around turning of these fractures. Um, you know, even today with all the advancements we've had, we generally over predict the length of these fractures. Um, we don't know exactly why. We think that there is a lot of energy that's lost around the main fracture due to the creation of these induced unpropped fractures. 
And, um, you know, these induced unprot fractures can actually play an extremely important role in controlling the, the development of these, um, of these uh, hydraulic, main hydraulic fracture. So the fluid leak off is generally much higher than we expect. We don't know exactly why. We think it's because of these uh, induced unprop fractures. And we, I actually wrote a paper on these induced unprop fractures a few years ago, pointing out that these induced unprop fractures do exist. We are only modeling the main fracture, but there's all kinds of activity happening at a smaller scale, right? which we don't model. Right? So, so that's something that we need to, need to do uh, to better understand. And, and um, sometimes we predict fracture lengths that are two, three, four times longer than we actually see in the field. Um, and so the question is why and how do you model that better? Right? So there's lots of, lots of room to improve. Professor Sharma, I have one question about, you know, uh, when I was with Slumberger, uh, I was involved with doing some hydraulic fracturing and then for particularly for this, uh, uh, you know, waxy oil reservoirs, it's not really for shale gas or oil. But what we observed is that, you know, the, the wax, uh, you know, gets uh, uh, deposited, you know, on the fractures, uh, mm -hmm. you know. So how to couple these flow assurance issues along with these fractures that we generally create for conventional reservoirs? Because in India, we have many waxy reservoirs. No? So what is your I mean, uh, observations on this particular problem? Well, one way, one way to do that would be to make the viscosity of the fluid a function of temperature. So if you're solving the energy balance and you're solving for the temperature in the fracture and in the reservoir, you can solve for the temperature and then you can make the viscosity of the oil a function of temperature. And that will account for the fact that you have a sudden increase in viscosity as the temperature goes down because of the wax appearance. And so that would be one way to do it. That would be one way to do it. And that will have a big impact on your flow back or your production. Right? So your production will, um, will be impacted by lower temperatures. Now, eventually it might warm up because by, by conduction, these, uh, the, that part of the reservoir around the fractures is going to become warmer and then that's going to be produced. But for, in the short term, it may have a big impact. But what we observed is that there is some hysteresis on the wax appearance and wax dissolution temperature. So mm. somewhere that really, because it's like micro crystalline waxes, they doesn't dissolve you know, at that particular mm. level. So what we observed, even that at uh, reservoir temperature, once this wax forms, they just, you know, remains there. You know, that's what lab, uh, you know, best experiments that has shown yeah. such uh, observations. Now that's an interesting problem. Sounds like something you have to have a PhD student work on. Exactly, yes. <laughs> so the other, problem, uh, other uh, you know, uh, question may not be directly related to the, uh, you know, the model part of it. But uh, there have been a lot of resistance as far as fracturing is concerned in you know, conventional and even unconventional reservoirs, particularly with respect to the seismics, uh, you know, and then uh, pollution related problem, you know, there, even in like South Tamil Nadu, we had some, uh, you know, uh, projects that were supposed to happen in Karaikal uh, oil field. And uh, there was a lot of resistance because of this environmental, uh, you know, activist, you know, saying that it may mess up with, uh, you know, the aquifer and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. what uh, you know, uh, even in, in, in your experience with respect to the U.S. oil fields, have you really observed, you know, number one, the seismic-related issues, uh, you know, as far as the instability of the reservoir is concerned, and the second is this, you know, pollution-related issues with respect to uh, you know portable aquifers. Right. So we have actually, uh, I have a talk that I have given many, many times related to. Uh, the environmental concerns related to hydraulic fracturing. And I'll be happy to send you that, those slides. Um, so there are, I have a top 10 list of concerns. Um, and so top 10 list of concerns, uh, in fact, uh, if I have a minute, maybe I can even pull it up. Uh, but it, it is, uh, anyway, I, I don't think I'll pull up that presentation, but, but it, so seismicity is, is, is real. Um, so there are ma many instances where hydraulic fracturing has caused um, uh, seismic events that can be felt on the surface. Um, the most famous and the most uh, obvious one is the one that happened in Oklahoma, just north of here, uh, where they have started observing a very large number of uh, small earthquakes occurring in a certain area in Oklahoma as a result of hydraulic fracturing. So that is very real. Um, what they did was 
they were injecting into the basement rock. And because of the injection into the basement rock, they started seeing slippage occurring in some of these faults. And that caused these problems. Um, by the way, the, the earthquakes were not caused by hydraulic fracturing. They were caused by injection of wastewater. So the volumes of water that they were injecting was about 100 times more than you inject in hydraulic fracturing. So all the water that they were producing was being re-injected into the basement. And because of that, they started seeing slippage in these falls. So they stopped re-injecting the water in that area and the problem went away. They trucked the water into a different place and injected into a different formation and there was no problem. So, so yes, of course, anything we do as human beings can cause problems. Uh, so, so you have to be careful. You, you, can't do, you can't do silly things like injecting into the San Andreas fault. Well, it's going to slip, you know. So, uh, so as long as you can engineer things properly and not be too uh, aggressive with, with your approach, then I think you will be fine. We have done over 2 million jobs in the US, right? Uh, hydraulic fracturing jobs. We have not seen a single instance of water contamination, not one, not a single one. Now, if this was a pharmaceutical trial, this would be called a huge success. No, no side effects as far as water pollution right, with this drug. But the benefits are enormous. The benefits are enormous. So I think just, just putting fear in people um, by saying that it's going to contaminate the groundwater and so on, I think that's, you have to look at the data. You know, you have to see where are you fracturing, how deep is it, how close is it, is it to, the, to the aquifer. You know, look at all the studies, do some engineering work, design work on making sure that you don't, do, uh, don't overdo it. But I think uh, contamination of aquifers has not been observed in the US. But seismic events, yes, that's been seen uh, in the US and abroad, uh, where they have seen uh, uh, small earthquakes being caused by, by uh, and you have to be careful not to, not to inject into areas that are uh, highly faulted. Yeah, and there are seven or eight other concerns that are in my slide deck, none of which are real, by the way, none of which are real. I think the seism seismicity is the only one that's real. Yeah. So two days back, the Tamil Nadu government had a constituted a committee to, mm -hmm. to see the feasibility of uh, oil and gas exploration activities in uh, part of the Tamil Nadu. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you will be surprised that there is no one uh, with a background in petroleum engineering. All are environmentalists. So, you know, you can understand what will be the fate of the, uh, <laughs> of the report that is going to come from this such committee. So just wanted to say that. Yeah. 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 I completely understand that, you know, Politically, it becomes a football. So it becomes very difficult to have a technical discussion. Yeah, Lali is, uh, you know, uh, make, having a smile because one faculty from his department is there on the committee. <laughs> no, uh, I'm very sorry. I think I don't want to comment on that. But sir, my question here is, uh, you know, you talk about the seismicity during the fracturing process. Mm -hmm. uh, but is there any fear that the created fractures in the future because of the any natural earthquake does it really having a, any role on you know the kind of episode can create on the ground surface? No, so so we actually measure uh, the micro seismic activity during fracturing. We've done this thousands of times, right? There's <laughs> micro seismic surveys done on hydraulic fracturing, um, and yes, we see we see these micro seismic events happening during fracturing. But it's the, the, the magnitude of these is minus one on the Richter scale. I mean, it's like a truck driving by. You will, you will, of course, you'll see seismic activity with a truck driving by, but, but it doesn't mean anything. It's only when you start reaching a Richter scale of about three or something that you begin to feel it as a human being. And that's extremely rare. In fact, none of these things in Oklahoma were related to hydraulic fracturing. It was all related to water injection. And when you stopped water injection, wastewater injection, then those, those things stopped. So... Is it possible that you can have seismic activity in the surface? Of course it's possible, but it's very, very highly unlikely, extremely unlikely. So if you do a cost benefit analysis, the benefits far outweigh the cost. Right? I hope I think there is no future uh, you know, effects of these created reactors on the overall seismicity, you know, seismicity of these. Particles. No, uh, th there's been no evidence of that whatsoever. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, my second question is uh, related to you talked about the you know the injection of gases uh, as a fracturing fluid. Uh, 
mm-hmm. uh, how they are really successful and then by any chance anybody tried to do with the uh, co2 injection for creating a fractures and then what would be the effects of the um, you know oh yes there has been uh, there has been um, uh, i would say several hundred hydraulic fractures done with co2 and with nitrogen um and uh, with methane uh, or or heavier uh, hydrocarbons um uh, i think uh, they have all been successful they have all been quite successful the only problem is that in modern hydraulic fracturing in a horizontal well the volumes of gas that you need are very very large so if you're doing a 30 stage if you have let's say 7000 foot long fra- uh, well and you have 30 stages and each stage has 10 fractures so let's say 300 fractures being created you need hundreds of trucks of nitrogen or uh, co2 to come to location to satisfy the volume of fluid that's needed so you need a very very large volume of fluid and that becomes a limitation because that amount of gas is not available and the logistics of getting that gas to location become very difficult that's been the big challenge okay so I think that's great. Uh, so I I'll, I'll give you an idea. Last week I was in the field fracturing a well just about 4 hour drive from here and we have built a 4 acre lake to fracture these dozen wells. Okay? It fills up with rainwater, it fills up with rainwater and we use that rainwater to fill up tanks and and so on. And you know, we pump about 8000 9000 barrels for each stage and we had 27 stages um uh, to convert that into gallons let's see how do i convert that into gallons uh, 8000 barrels will be uh 8000 times 42 so about 350000 gallons per stage so it's a very large volume of, of, of fluid and um so so that's you know several million gallons of, of fluid uh, in in a single well so the volumes of of fluid being are required are are, are quite large um now the nice thing is that this is all water that would otherwise have been you know uh, wasted and in fact one of the one of the slides i have in my talk on environmental impact on hydraulic fracturing is on water a lot of people have said oh you're wasting a lot of water you're spending you know a huge amount of water and so on but if you compare that with a municipal use or with agricultural use it's less than 1% right so so it's it's small relative to the other uses of water thank you very much sir i think for your you know insightful uh, thank you response uh, the another aspect what you really mentioned about the in case of a propent and then the segregation of a propent versus the fluid uh, i believe i think uh, maybe the, some efforts have been made on the you know making the entire suspension as a highly viscous zone so that you can able to redistribute versus the cluster 1 versus this cluster 4 is that any mm-hmm. kind of a effort sir it's a really silly thing to do that sir so uh, 20 years ago uh, most of the fractures that were being pumped were being pumped using viscous fluids Uh, polymers gels and so on today nobody is using polymer n- nobody is using viscous fluids anymore and the reason is well two reasons one it turns out that using slick water which is basically polyacrylamide which is about 10 million molecular weight added to water at low concentrations that reduces the um uh, the the frictional pressure drop in the well bore and it makes a huge difference right so you can reduce the frictional pressure drop in a pipe by about 40% by simply adding poly, uh, uh, polyacrylamide so we add a small concentration of polyacrylamide and that actually causes the frictional pressure drop to decrease quite a lot and when you're pumping at very high rates like we pump typically at about 90 barrels a minute in 90 barrels a minute is what is 90 times 42 so that is about 4000 gallons a minute okay of fluid very very high flow rate the reynolds numbers are about 300000 so uh, so frictional pressure drop is very important and so you reduce the frictional pressure drop by adding a small amount of polyacrylamide and if you use a viscous fluid then you have to drop your rate by a quarter <laughs> 
And so people don't like to do that. Um, they like to go at very high rates and they would like to use essentially water that has a viscosity of about two centipoise, <clears throat> um, but it has a very, very good frictional reduction capabilities. In turbulent flow, adding a little bit of polymer actually reduces the delta P right, in the pipe uh, by a lot. So, so that's what people are doing these days is they're not using it in polymer. They're cutting down on cost by uh, not using gels or high concentration of polymers. And they're using very cheap sand. They used to use this very expensive sand, white sand and so on. Now everybody's using local sand. So the cost has become one third so, so that's the primary driver right now is use water and use local sand, typically about 100 mesh or 40, 70 mesh. Thank you very much, Sarya. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Professor Sharma, we have uh, many questions in the panel, but I just wanted to ask a couple more questions before we go there. Uh, one mm -hmm. is uh, uh, why finite volume, uh, you know, as opposed to the traditionally used finite element methods for solid deformation? Yeah, and the finite element has some advantages. Uh, the advantage of finite element is it's much more, it's much easier to incorporate new physics into it. So if you start with a finite element code, uh, adding new physics becomes much more difficult. Um, and so we chose and in, in a way, as you know, a finite volume is a special case of finite elements. Right? With the basis functions being defined appropriately, you can go to finite volume. And for all practical purposes, the numerics works out fine. We also had this open foam uh, toolbox available to us in finite volume. So we said, okay, that's a good toolbox to use. So all the bookkeeping, all the the meshing and grids and so on are, are taken care of uh, by that. So it's a simpler way of doing it in, in numerically. Uh, we are not experts on numerical methods like you are, uh, but we do have a big group here working on numerical methods, which I think you may be familiar with, you know, Babushka and Mary Wheeler and Demkowitz and so some of those guys, uh, Tom Perkins and so on. So there's a bunch of people here doing numerical and they are doing some outstanding work. My expertise is not in numerical methods. I, I'm a user of numerical methods rather than a developer of numerical methods. So I'm not an applied mathematician like they are. Um, so, so we uh, chose to use a method that was well-established where the physics was easier to incorporate. So these tools are open, uh, openly available, the frog uh, simulators that you the mentioned? The frog libraries are unfortunately not openly available, but some of the tools in the frog libraries are in open form now. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, so the second question I had was, uh, how do you validate these field scale simulations? What are some of the techniques that are available? That's an excellent question because, um, when I was working in other areas like EOR and so on and 30 years ago, uh, we would validate our, ex our simulators by experiments. Unfortunately, you can't really do experiments with hydraulic fracturing very easily on a small scale. Everything has to be done on a large scale. So you have to go to the field and the field becomes your laboratory, right? And making measurements in the field is not easy. It's expensive and it's hard. So we have been using fracture diagnostic methods so we use traces, we use fiber optic data. So we have done quite a bit of work jointly with Shell and Devon and other companies here where we go to their wells and then they run the fiber. Now, each of these fiber deployments costs about $2 million. So it's not an easy experiment to run, but they have been kind enough to make that data available to us. That's why we work so closely with many of these companies uh, because we need that data to validate this. If you ask somebody, how long is the fracture? Nobody's going to go down 10,000 feet in the ground and find out how long is the fracture, right? But you can do pressure interference between wells. You can see if this well is seeing the other well by simply shutting in this well and saying, oh, does this well react to it? Okay, you can do tracer experiments. You can inject tracer here. You can see if it comes out here. You can do fiber optic measurements. So there are diagnostic methods that you can use, which are very indirect. They're not as clean as laboratory, you know, small scale stuff, but you need to validate these on a big scale. So you have to go to the field. Uh, 
and and ultimately that's what counts anyway, right? In the field. So uh, EOR works very well on a four. So that it usually doesn't work in the field, and and and, and so so that's that's the challenge is is developing diagnostic tools for the field. So it's a it's a very good question, and it's hard. So the question, the answer is it's hard, but we do have some tools that we can use to validate. Sure. Thank you. So, is that data now published, or you know, yes. it's still proprietary? Most of, that, most of the yeah, most of the data we use is all published. We have probably I don't know, fifteen twenty papers with uh, field data in it. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. I will go yeah. to the Q and A panel. I think we have about uh, seven questions here. Uh, so okay. the first one is from uh, Mr. Milad, and he's asking um, if the results of these fracture simulations. Um, if they're only used uh, by the group of oil companies or whether reservoir engineers can incorporate these results. Um, and if do they, if they do, how do they incorporate the shape of these simulated fractures in their full field simulations? Right, so in our case, the, uh, the fracturing simulation and the reservoir simulation can all be done within the same tool, within the same simulator. Uh, historically, what people have done is they've run the fracturing simulator separately, taken the geometry of the fractures from there, and then imported it into a reservoir simulator. But for us, it's all the same. The reservoir simulator the fracture is, all, is all one. So you can run the fracturing simulation first, and then run the reservoir simulation right after that in, within the same toolbox, in the same simulator. So it becomes very easy to, for us to do that without having to transfer the geometry from one to the other. Uh, so the other question we have is by Mr. Fulchan Mahato, and he's asking, how can we model fracture propagation in a layered and thinly bedded formation? Uh, I think you alluded to this uh, towards mm -hmm. the end of your talk. Yes, so we, uh, we actually uh, uh, can put in as many layers as you want. We have actually put in up to 105 layers in, in our simulations. Um, the only thing that we assume in, in make, doing these simulations is that there is no slip between the layers. Uh, so there's, these layers are bonded together. Um, that may or may not be true. In some cases, those, those things may slip. Um, uh, and if they do, then we have to do something special to account for that. But otherwise, we can put in variations in uh, layer properties, moduli, and so on over many, many layers. Uh, stresses can be different. So, so that's part of uh, gridding the whole system and making sure that the grids are small relative to the layer thickness. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is asking you uh, if the presence of critically stressed faults uh, affect the orientation and propagation of fractures. And if it does, uh, how do you incorporate that into your fracturing model? That's a good question. Um, so uh, yes, critically stressed faults and uh, natural fractures do impact the geometry of the fractures a lot. Um, I didn't show you examples of that, um, but we have uh, many examples of, in fact, if you go to my website, uh, you will see papers which talk about how hydraulic fractures propagate when you have multiple natural fractures and, and criti critically stressed faults. So whether it goes through the natural fracture or whether it goes along it and so on, we've done all those simulations. Um, uh, and so that's incorporated in the model. And there's, I would say probably half a dozen papers we have written on, on that. And those are all on, the, on, the, on my website. So I'm sorry I couldn't show you those slides today, but, but uh, there's quite a few uh, studies we've done like that. Uh, so the next question is, uh... Will the composition of the porous media filling the existing fault play a big role for reactivation of faults uh, or cracks during fluid injection? Well, what controls the behavior of the fault or the crack uh, is how mineralized the crack is. In other words, if the crack is highly mineralized and so there's good bonding between the two layers, then most likely the, the mechanical properties of that crack are strong enough uh, where it won't slip. But if it's a very weak connection between the layers, then um, you have to account for slip and uh, sliding of these, of these things. So we do specify the coefficient of friction of, the, of these faults. Uh, we do specify the cohesion between the layers. That's something that we, that we put in. Um, 
But whether we actually have those values measured, we don't. Right? We don't know exactly how well mineralized many of these faults are. Um, so, so the way around this has been to actually run some science wells. So there's been three or four different science wells that we have been part of where tens of millions of dollars have been spent on doing a tremendous amount of analysis of these natural fractures and how they affect the geometry and so on. Um, in fact, all that information is public domain. So you can actually go to the DOE website and go to the hydraulic fracturing test site number one or the hydraulic fracturing test site number two and all the logs, all the information about the rocks, all the layers, all the natural fractures, all the hydraulic fracturing data is all public information. And there were 11 horizontal wells that were drilled. There was hydraulic fractures created in one well, and then there was a well that was drilled ne right next to it that was cored. So we took core all along the well and we characterized, so we intersected the hydraulic fracture. And then we actually analyzed what the hydraulic fracture looked like in the core. Um, so this is something that I think is, uh, this is hydraulic fracturing test site number one. And then number two, uh, both of these were done in West Texas. And so all that data is available. And that's, I would say, very valuable data because there was over a hundred million dollars spent on it. So um, one other question we have here is, uh, what are some of the outputs from these simulations uh, that can be used by uh, design engineers? Yeah, good question. So uh, there are uh, several things that we typically get asked to do by companies um, that are very useful. Um, one is the design of the fracture itself. So when you talk about design of the hydraulic fractures, there are some very basic questions that you have to provide to the operator. How much fluid should you pump? How much sand should you pump? What is the rate at which you should pump? What is the size of sand that you should use? How should you ramp up the concentration of sand? How should you design the, the perforations? How many clusters? Do we need five clusters? Do we need eight, 10, 12? How many perforations in each cluster? All those things have to be specified by the operator, right? So all those design questions are answerable based on these simulations on the fracturing side. On the reservoir side, how does the uh, design change, how does that affect the performance of the well, the flowback? Will you get higher oil and gas production rates? Will you get, under what conditions will you get uh, higher rates? Under what conditions will you get lower rates? So you can run economics based on the flowback that you get from these, uh, from these simulations. So there's, a lot of work done on trying to understand you know, what can we do to improve the performance of these wells. And I will say that in the last 10 years, since 2010 or 11 to now, the productivity of these wells has improved by a factor of four, four times, 400% increase in productivity of these wells. And the cost has dropped by a factor of three. So it's remarkable how much change has happened just in the last 10 years. And that is all because of these design changes that we have made. It's the same rock, same geology, same reservoir. You get four times, five times more production now than you used to get before. Um, and you, you re reduce the cost by three times. So it's, it's remarkable how, how much change there, is, there has been uh, in the last 10 years. Oh, you're muted, uh, Chandra. Oh, yeah, sorry. I was saying we have two more questions. So one question is, uh, uh, how do we incorporate uh, data-driven models in physics-based models? Yeah, so there's many ways to do it. Um, there's, this has become a, a very, um, it's become a buzzword and it's become very fashionable to call it um, um, machine learning or, or deep learning or, or there's many terms for it, but it's become very fashionable to use this. Um, the way we have used it is uh, we run these very complex simulations, like I showed you, the CFT DEM simulations, which require days and days of computation. Um, and then we ultimately have uh, an output or two or three outputs. 
and we have a bunch of inputs. So we change the inputs and we run it over a parameter space. And then we develop correlations, you know, simple correlations that relate the outputs to the inputs. So these are simple correlations. It doesn't have to be a neural net. It could simply be a, a set of correlations. So these correlations that can then be incorporated in a very simple algebraic way into your numerical simulations. And that's what we've done is, um, now that can be done uh, if you have a relatively simple set of inputs and outputs, right? If you have three or four outputs, maybe 10 different inputs, you can do that. If things get more complicated with more uh, variables in the input and more outputs, you have to do it with more complex tools like neural nets and, and so on. So um, we have used neural nets, but not directly in the numerical simulator. We've just you know, used correlations in, in the numerical sense. So that's how we do these surrogate, we call them surrogate models because they are really empirical correlations that reflect what the, the large simulations are telling us. So thank you, Professor Sharma. So the final question is a little bit philosophical in nature. Uh, and they're asking, uh, uh, now that electric vehicles are coming, uh, what would be the future of hydrocarbon production? Yeah, so the, the answer to that question is, uh, I get asked that question a lot. So um, there are, um, the answer depends on, on, on your point of view and, and, and who, you, who you ask. I personally feel that um, electric cars will slowly make their way into the market. Um, I don't think it's going to be as quick as we, uh, many of us are hoping, um, like 2030 or 2035. I think that's uh, not going to happen. Um, I think it's going to take about 20 years, maybe 25 years. And in all likelihood, there's going to be some breakthrough, some smart guy somewhere is going to come up with a better battery uh, or a better energy storage device. And that's when the transition will truly accelerate. Uh, because the way it stands right now uh, with the lithium ion batteries that are being used in Teslas and so on, um, I'm surrounded by, by Tesla guys, so um, there are factories here and the, the guys who develop the lithium ion battery are in the next building to me. And so, so I mean, this is all stuff that I, I see, I, I run into these people in the parking garage and I, so I talk to them and I ask them, you know, what's the developments? It's a hard problem, you know. Uh, the storage capacity on a per weight basis for batteries is about 190th that of oil, right? So you need 90 times more weight to store the same amount of energy. So that's a big gap. That ha gap has to be narrowed down, right? Uh, if you're going to be serious about using, using uh, storage uh, with electric uh, vehicles and so on. So I think it's going to come. Um, but it's not going to happen as fast as many of the media. The media always tends to exaggerate things a little bit, in my opinion. Um, so, you know, artificial intelligence is going to replace everybody. And, you know, that's nonsense. I mean, it's, it's not. Um, so I, I, self-driving cars are going to be here next year. And, you know, one of my classmates who's at uh, Jitendra Malik, who's at Berkeley, he works in this stuff. And he says, not in my lifetime, it won't happen. And he's, he's developing these things, right? So. So it's, it's, it's overstated. I think it's overstated. So I believe that fossil fuels are going to be around for your lifetime and mine. Um, and, uh, but we are going to have gradual increase in uh, electric vehicles and so on over the next 20 years, maybe 25 years. But I want to add that even if we have an electric vehicle, like, as you said, like batteries are energy storage device, right? We need uh, energy resources, right? Correct. So from where the energy will come, and as you sh as you have shown in one of the slides, we still dominates like fossil fuel still dominates as energy resources. Yeah. So the only way is to uh, change our power plants from coal. I mean, maybe you know uh, have more coal based fire, you know, gas based power plants. So the what will change is the way we will use the hydrocarbons. May not be directly in our automobiles, but maybe in the power plants to generate electricity. That's yeah. what yeah. you know. I think so. I think you're right. I think I totally agree because, um, you know, electricity or is not a primary source of energy. It has to come from somewhere. Exactly. Yes, exactly. So that's hydrogen, is, hydrogen is not a primary source of energy either. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's where the people, you know, confuse a lot, you know, and many times 
I mean, many times whenever I talk to in front of the students, BTEC students, then I clearly show that even if you have electric vehicle, I think the dependence on the fossil energy will not go away at least uh, next 50 to 80 years. And looking I, at I the agree. Uh, gas hydrate, for example, you know, like we know that, you know, gas hydrate, even if we uh, support 1% of our recovery, it may support like 100 years of our natural gas requirement. That's what the predictions are right now. And uh, looking at some of the success stories in, uh, you know, South China Sea and, uh, you know, uh, Nankai Trough in Japan, where they have produced natural gas from hydrate reservoirs, I guess, I think uh, we'll have more natural gas coming up in near future, possibly. That's what my understanding is. Yeah, I, I agree with you. The natural gas will play a, a more and more important role. Um, yes. And I think coal is probably going to be phased out uh, slowly, very slowly, but it's going to be phased out. Although China has just built 40 new coal power plants, so um, and India is still building a lot of coal power plants. But I think natural gas use is going to grow. Um, um, I don't know if hydrates is the solution. Um, it still remains to be seen. Uh, it's very difficult to actually produce natural gas from hydrates. Uh, but I think there's a lot of natural gas uh, available in many, many parts of the world. And there's giant gas reservoirs that are being discovered uh, that will produce a lot of natural gas. And it's a, it's a very, it's a relatively clean burning fuel. It's a relatively clean burning fuel. So, and it is a primary source of energy. It's a primary source of energy. So it may be that somebody clever will come along and convert um, methane into hydrogen uh, in some simple, easy way, which is, which we don't have right now. I mean, it's, it's not easy to do that. What about but, this water splitting um, reaction that people talks about? Water splitting reaction to produce hydrogen. You know, a lot of research is looking at. Yeah, how do you split water with electrolysis? <laughs> you need electricity, right? <laughs> it's like it's like catching your nose like this instead of catching <laughs> it like this, right? <laughs> One more question that you know uh, you have been associated with uh, must be like ONGC for like years now. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are like uh, very young as far as uh, our association with engineering field is concerned. Uh, what do you think that why India has not been able to uh, explore oil and gas or whether we do not have oil and gas in our country? Or we have resources, but we have not really looked at it. Up to I mean, yeah, no, I think India def definitely has reserves of oil and gas. There's no question that it does. Uh, I think, I think the, the problem lies in the way the sector is organized. Exactly. Yeah, that's um, what. Yeah. So there's plenty of reserves. There's plenty of opportunity. It's just that most countries, including India, feel that it is a national treasure and they don't want to let anybody near it, um, which becomes a problem because if you, if you don't let anybody near it, then, then you can't utilize it. So, so uh, that, that's, a, that's a real problem. That's a real problem. You know, the U.S. is the only country where the uh, minerals, the ownership of the minerals uh, uh, is private property. It's the only country in the world. So if I own a piece of land, if I own a ranch, then I own the oil and gas underneath it. And that makes a huge difference. That makes a huge difference. So if I go to a farmer and I tell him, I want to drill a well on your property. And by the way, you will get 20% royalty on everything that is produced. He's thrilled. He's thrilled, right? If you go to a farmer in India and tell him, I want to drill a well on your property, he's going to be panicked. He's going to say, go away. Because he knows that if you find oil and gas on his property, the government will take it over. So private ownership of mineral rights is the biggest thing that has made oil and gas successful in the US. That is by far the biggest factor. Because everybody is excited about developing. I mean, in Texas, in the Eagleford, for example, south of here, uh, there are huge ranches, 5,000, 10,000 acres, and people are getting checks of $200,000 a month just from royalties on land that was worthless before because they own the mineral rights. But in India, there, it's a disaster. If somebody finds oil and gas on your property, it's a total disaster because you, know, you lose it. So that really makes a big difference. And um, unfortunately, there's no easy solutions to that. Politically, there's no way you can change that. 
but you can change the private sector. So for example, in places like England uh, or places like Brazil uh, or most, most of South America, uh, uh, you can see um, that privatization has helped. Um, so Petrobras has, for example, come a long ways. I mean, they, they were very, they were government owned, extremely corrupt and so on in, in Brazil. Uh, they've come a long ways. Um, but then there are places like Mexico, which are like India, uh, where, you know, everything is government controlled and their production has been dropping steadily. Uh, because really, I'll give you a great example. About 25 years ago, I was in ONGC and when they opened the center in Punvel, uh, IOGPT, in, uh, whatever yes. it's... Uh, Institute of Oil and Gas Production Technology. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. So they had opened that center about 25 years ago and I asked me to come. So I visited and I spent a couple of days there. I remember there was a gentleman who was a general manager, um, Mr. Gyan Singh. So he said, so what do you think of our facility? So I said, you know, this is a world-class facility. It is, you have some of the most, you have the best equipment, some of the best people, and you know, it can be very successful, but you have a problem. He says, what is the problem? He says, the pro I said, the problem is all these people have zero motivation to do anything. <laughs> you know, he's going to get his salary regardless of whether he gets, if I want to get a $10 million project from Petronas, I'm increasing my work. And I'm not going to be rewarded for it. Right? Why, why should I do it? Right. Why should I do it? I said, if you can motivate people by offering them something, financial or otherwise, something that, that you know, promote them faster or, or give them 1% of the projects they bring in, give them 1% or 2% of the projects they bring in, that'll motivate them. Otherwise, why should an engineer sitting in ONGC in Panvel do anything? You know, at 10 years, he's going to become executive engineer. At 20 years, he's going to become supervising engineer or whatever the ranks are. You know, 30 years, he's going to become general manager, regardless of what he does. So why should he do anything? So I think without motivation, you are not going to make, you're not going to get anybody to do anything. And uh, I think that's the biggest problem in my view. But you, do, you don't lack people. You, there's the smartest people around. You don't lack equipment. You don't like facilities. Equipment facilities are there, but there's no motivation to do anything. So he I said, did. "Well, that's true." He says, oh, "But but you know, we give them gold stars and we give them awards." And I said, "You know, gold stars are great, but I mean, it's uh, <laughs> it's not real motivation." <laughs> so so it's, I think that is the biggest issue, and I think um, that's that's why I feel like um, uh, in the U.S. people are. Uh, have set up a system where relatively ordinary people can do some pretty extraordinary things because they're highly motivated. Right. Looks like Ramesh has his hand raised. Uh, yeah. Another question? Yeah. Thanks, Sharma, for sharing your experience. Uh, I think we got a lot of stuff today. Um, but I was uh, trying to ask one question related to uh, fluid injection. So. Uh, you find a lot of porous, uh, highly porous reservoirs, especially in Mexico and other places. Uh, when you use fluid like like water, um, how does the, the fracture response uh, when you just inject in these porous reservoirs? Uh, any any idea or any? Can you can you clarify your question a little bit? I didn't quite understand. So, so when you start injecting water into this highly porous reservoirs. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, can you comment or uh, comment on the fractures that will be formed? Is it uh, um, do you need to in inject a lot of water to create the fractures, or uh, because like it's not viscous? Again, you're not injecting a viscous fluid. Right? I understand. I understand. I understand. Yeah. So, we used to have an industrial consortium from 1980s, 89 to about 90, 98 or something like that. Uh, related to water injection and fracturing. Um, uh, at that time, in the, uh, in the mid 80s and earlier, 
uh, the the wisdom, the the historical wisdom was that you never fracture an injection well. Right, that was the idea. You never fracture an injection well, and people in uh, I remember this French guy who was with the with Total who used to say, "Oh, we never fracture our injectors." And what we discovered was, and we did a project with Shell back then, and this is published in the paper in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, where they stayed below the fracturing pressure, and their injectivity went down very quickly because of the particles in the water. Right, very quickly the injectivity within about three months, four months, injectivity went down, and this was a one Darcy sand. Right, so. Said, what's going on? And you know, in places like Alaska, where they were injecting two million barrels a day, injectivity was constant, completely constant. So, what happens in these injection wells is you inject relatively clean water, even through filters, multiple filters. It still has some particles in it, and those particles plug these pores. And as the pores get plugged, the pressure builds up slightly because you're injecting at a constant rate. So you're bottom hole pressure starts to go up. As the bottom hole pressure goes up, you, you somehow at some point exceed the fact gradient. And so you create a fracture. As the fracture is created, the, a new surface area is created for the particles to plug. The particles plug that, and then the fracture grows some more. And over time, these injection wells, 98% of them are all fractured, even though you don't know it. Right? Most injection wells in the world are fractured. Without, without, being, without intending to fracture them. Now, you don't intend to fracture them, but they're all fractured. Because you don't see, there's no red flag that comes out on the surface and tells you, oh, this well is fractured. You don't even know it. You know, the fracture gradually grows. How do we know this? We actually ran experiments on large block tests where we injected water with different water quality. And sure enough, you know, at some point, the fracture. and the, the nice thing is, that the injectivity or the injection pressure remains constant. So injectivity will remain flat. There's no change in injection pressure. But the fracture is continuing to grow. And how fast will the fracture grow and how long will it grow? That depends on the water quality. So if the water quality is bad, it has a lot of particles in it, it'll grow long and tall. If the water quality is good, then it'll be short and not very tall. So these fractures grow anywhere from 10 feet to thousands of feet in all injection wells. I would say virtually all injection wells. And every refinery in India and, and in the world, I should say, has injection wells where the waste is disposed. Every single one of them. And they're all fractured, I can guarantee you. Okay. Intentionally or unintentionally. So... This is a big change in philosophy that happened in the 90s, in the early 90s. Um, so what that did actually was it upset a lot of people whose business was to treat the water. So there was a huge community of people that would treat water and they would filter it and then filter it again and filter it again to get very extremely good water quality to inject. And this is exactly what happened in Alaska. They built a half a billion dollar facility to treat the water. And in the winter, when the temperature was minus 40 degrees, they would be too, it was too cold to go out and change filters, so they would bypass it. They would bypass the whole facility. And the injectivity was constant. There was no change. And they said, well, what's going on? You know, we're injecting dirty water, 2,000 parts per million of solids, and there's no change in the injectivity. Well. Guess what? If you're fracturing the wells, injectivity doesn't change no matter what you inject. So then what they said was, oh, well, well, let's just bypass the facility. Right? So you don't need to treat the water. So you save hundreds of millions of dollars not treating the water and injecting dirty water. The price that you're paying is that you get longer fractures. So we have several papers on, on, on this topic of how does the water quality affect growth of fractures in injection wells? Um, and it, 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 it completely changed the industry in terms of what the facilities are, what facilities are needed for treating the water. Because at, you can always say, I'm not going to treat my water at all. I'm just going to inject completely untreated water in the ground. And you can do that as long as you're willing to accept the fact that you have fractures growing over time. Or you can have some treatment and then, you know, control the length of the fracture. 
This is a very interesting problem because it has a big effect on the economics of water injection projects. I was just asking this question because even BP right now, they're just uh, interested in this particular topic. On... But BP has had a big effort in this. In fact, BP was the operator of the Alaska project. Mm -hmm. They have papers on this. There's a guy named Lawrence Murray, who's uh, at the uh, BP uh, uh, Sunbury Research Center, who used to come down for our meetings in 90. He's still there. I think he's still there. Maybe he's retired. I don't know. Um, but he has, if you look under his name, Lawrence Murray, you'll see some papers. And in fact, the original work was started by, by Arco, and Arco was bought by BP in the 90s. And so, so that the BP has been very active in this area. And in fact, when we had this joint industry project with the industry, there were like 10, 12 companies that were members. Uh, that's when this whole transition happened of not filtering versus filtering or treating the brine versus not treating the brine. It, it totally changed water flooding and it totally changed the way we, we deal with things. In fact, it's funny because there's a book on, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but there's an SPE book on water flooding written by a guy named Paul Wilhite, who's at Kansas. He's 10 years older than me. I was giving a talk once and in that whole book, there is no mention of fractures on water flooding. And I said, Paul, You've written a book on water flooding and there's hydraulic frac or any kind of fractures are not mentioned in the book. Did you realize that over 95% of the injection wells that you're dealing with are fractured and that has a huge impact on water flooding. He says, you know, you're absolutely right. Next edition, I'm going to have three chapters on, on fractures in water flood because, you know, it has a big impact on, on, on water. So the, the, changing cha the, the thinking changed in about the 90s of how, what a big impact these fractures can have. And it can have a huge impact on water flow. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Sharma. I don't think we have any more uh, questions. Good. Good, 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 box. Good, good. Yeah. I'm glad I was but, able to participate with you guys and uh, thank you for hosting me. And uh, um, hopefully you guys uh, got some ideas and some, some, some new thoughts. Absolutely. Thanks very much again for an insightful talk and a very engaging Q&A. Uh, we enjoyed it very much. Great, great. Thank you, Chandra. And thank, thank you, Jitendra, all of you, all the faculty and the students there. Thank you, Professor Shiva. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. Bye. Thank you very much. Um, as you are very late today, okay, have, have step drive, okay, we'll talk tomorrow.